Welcome to today's event, Securing the World, Emerging Threats and American Defense Policy. We're delighted to be partnering with the Penn Biden Center for Diplomacy and Global Engagement on this exciting uh, event. Uh, before I introduce today's speakers, I will turn it over to Dr. Michael Carpenter, the Managing Director of the Penn Biden Center, who will make a few welcoming remarks through a pre-recorded video message. Securing the world, emerging threats and American defense policy. There is literally no one better suited to address this topic than Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel. And today, there are a great power competition when you have the Russian attack challenges in Russia, China, Iran, North Korea, and other countries, as well as contend with new and emerging capabilities the use of artificial intelligence, quantum computing, even biotechnology and nanotechnology. How do those impact our ability to defend ourselves and extend the deterrence to our allies abroad, both in Europe, in Asia, and elsewhere in the world? Uh, I'm very excited that we have this opportunity uh, to partner on this event and very much looking forward to the remarks from Secretary Hagel. Thank you. <coughs> Thanks again to the Penn Biden Center for their partnership on today's event. And we're honored to be featuring two Perry World House visiting fellows today. Uh, our speaker, former Secretary of Defense Chuck Hagel and Trudy Rubin of the Philadelphia Inquirer who will be moderating today's event. Uh, Chuck Hagel was the 24th Secretary of Defense uh, serving from 2013 to 2015. He's the only Vietnam veteran and the first enlisted combat veteran to serve as Secretary of Defense. Prior to his leadership at the Pentagon, he served two terms in the US Senate representing the great state uh, of Nebraska. He is the author of the book, America, Our Next Chapter, and a graduate of the University of Nebraska at uh, Omaha. Our moderator today, Trudy Rubin, is the foreign affairs columnist for the Philadelphia Inquirer, a member of the Inquirer's editorial board, and a visiting fellow at Perry World House. In 2019, she received the Overseas Press Club of America's Flora Lewis Award for Best Commentary in International Affairs. In 2017 and in 2001, she was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in Commentary. Thank you, Secretary Hagel, for taking the time to be with us here today to talk about the future of U.S. defense policy. And thank you, uh, Trudy, for moderating today's discussion. I'll now turn the floor over to Secretary Hagel for short opening remarks. Michael, uh, thank you very much. And thanks to Perry World House and, and uh, the Biden Center at the University of Pennsylvania and to uh, all of your support people, all the professors, uh, all the team that makes uh, makes it go. I'm uh, uh, very privileged, and I appreciate the opportunity to give you some of my thoughts today and share some some thinking about uh, world affairs, national security, the future, and uh, also I appreciate being uh, uh, being with Trudy because uh, just as uh, the introduction said, she's one of the best. She uh, understands the world, has written about the world, lived around the world. So uh, thanks uh, to all of you and uh, again uh, to Trudy. Well, I'll make uh, just a couple of remarks and then we'll open it up and see uh, what you all want to talk about. Trudy and I'll uh, have uh, some time to kind of discuss different things and then uh, we'll go to questions. But I think uh, if we're framing the subject matter up, the topic of, of today, uh, you've got to, I think, frame it up by first understanding uh, and noting that uh, there is no such thing as status quo in the world. Um, the challenges, the threats, the opportunities uh, don't stay the same. Uh, a nation, uh, personal lives aren't the same today as they are going to be tomorrow. Yesterday's gone. Today's different from yesterday. And so I think that is always essential to understanding what our threats are, what our opportunities are, what challenges are. At the same time, we are living in a world that's undergoing, uh, uh, in many ways, a renewal, a reevaluation, a rethinking. For example, I, I think 
the world that we helped create and led in creating after World War II, a new liberal world order, uh, building international institutions that had never had ever been built before, based on the common interest of all peoples around the world, a better opportunity, a better um, econ economy, more hope, more security. And those institutions that were built, the United Nations, Collective Security, NATO, IMF, World Bank, General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, which is now WTO, and dozens of international development banks and institutions uh, were essentially the guiding force uh, of, of many of the foreign issues and challenges that the world faced over the last 70 years. That's all in question now. Uh, and there's a lot of challenge to that world order. Just as I said, there's no status quo in anything. Things are changing. We're uh, now currently uh, in the middle, I hope toward the end of a global health pandemic and not, not a US health pandemic, but a global health pandemic, which uh, has affected everything in our country, of course, in the world. Economies, security, intelligence gathering and, and sharing, uh, education, our culture, our society, uh, every country has been affected. That's just one dynamic. Uh, the more obvious, uh, what's happening in China, as China is exploding uh, with an economy. Uh, also connected to that, uh, they're, uh, investing now in far more uh, military hardware, uh, satellites, sophistication of cyber that we are dealing with and will deal with for forever um, is a challenge that we didn't really have 10 years ago. The Russians uh, are resurgent, the Iranians uh, are resurgent, the North Koreans are still a problem, the Middle East um, is in chaos, parts of Africa are in chaos. So. Uh, all of this we're trying to deal with at the same time, uh, restructuring, rebuilding our economy here in this country. And rebuilding and restructuring our own economy does affect and is, an, uh, is the underpinning for our national security, for the interests uh, of, of our security uh, and the interests around the world. And no country can be secure if their economy is not secure or if their culture, their society is not secure. And I don't think I need to remind anybody about what is going on politically in this country, the political divide, the paralysis that's resulted from this divide. Uh, I think probably 1968 was the last time we saw anything like this, but this is far beyond, far beyond 1968, the political dynamics in this country. Uh, can we rebuild this uh, country? Can we do, in the interest of all of the country, Republicans, Democrats, and everybody, can we come together enough uh, to, to face this and to take on these new challenges and find new ways to compete as we are well into the 21st century? Uh, and that all affects our national security. So uh, a lot to talk about. Uh, I've covered a lot of ground in those two or three minutes of remarks, but I think all of those factors that I've noted uh, are, are part of, of what we are dealing with and what we're probably gonna be talking about here in the next hour. So, uh, Trudy, uh, whatever you wanna talk about. Uh, well, first of all, it's really a pleasure to be able to have this conversation with you. And thanks to Perry Worldhouse, and uh, I want to pick up on several of the points that you made. Uh, it's fascinating. That it's only six years since you stepped down as Secretary of Defense, right? And at that time, we were still fighting ISIS. We were trying to pivot to Asia, but we were stuck in the Middle East. So um, do I take it from what you said that you think the major security threats to the US now are uh, geopolitical, um, uh, the rise of China and whether we can handle it, um, a revanchist Russia, 
is that the way it looks to you? And if it is, how do you define the China threat? Well, uh, Trudy, uh, certainly China is part uh, of the equation, in, in my opinion. When Jim Mattis was Secretary of Defense, um, in um, its normal, regular process of our national security review, which develops our national security strategy, and every incoming president does that. And uh, soon after Mattis took over, uh, they, they did that. And uh, what they came up with was that China is the number one threat concern to the United States. And I think, I think that's right. But it's bigger than China. It's bigger than China. And, and one of the factors in, in, in dealing with China, and you mentioned geopolitical dynamics, and that's right, uh, is uh, the strength and relationship of our allies, the strength of our alliances. And one of the things, as, as you know, and, and everybody on this call knows, uh, President Biden has talked about, as, as a candidate for president, rebuilding, restructuring, restrengthening those alliances. And so far in his first 100 days, he's talked about that. He's moved on that. Uh, his Secretary of Defense has been overseas talking about it, Secretary of State. That's a component uh, of this as well. But I mentioned cyber. When you look at cyber as, as one of, of the weapons that uh, countries have, uh, this insidious, uh, deadly, weapon that can strike out of nowhere. You don't know it's coming. You don't know where it's coming from uh, and when it will hit and the damage it can do without moving one ship or one plane or one troop anywhere. And so that's a, a factor now into, yes, the China component, but it's bigger. Trudy, I think it's bigger than China. I think it's all the things that I mentioned, uh, what, what Russia is up to. Russia is always probing. It's Russia is not the Soviet Union. They don't have near the capabilities. And I suspect they, certainly in the near term, they're not going to have for a lot of reasons, their economy and so on. But now with cyber as, as such a, an effective tool and a weapon for countries, non-state actors can play in this game too. You don't need big armies and you don't need a lot of money on defense. And so Russia, uh, is probably the best at it next to us, but China is very good. North Korea is very good. Iran's very good. Our allies uh, have uh, great ability. So what I'm saying is, I think it's it's the total, it's uh, it, it's the dynamic that we're facing as a world leader, and I think that's in question as well uh, because I think the the world is looking at us and asking the question. Are you still the world leader? Are, do you still want to be the world leader? Uh, and that's not the message we've received certainly over the last four years. And maybe you're not capable of it anymore. Uh, China is not going to replace you as a, uh, as a world leader as we've seen over the last 70 years, but it too is a world leader. A lot of, a lot of nations are looking at it this way and the reality of accommodating China uh, is something that they're all dealing with, especially Asian Pacific powers, and especially our allies and partners in Asia. Well, uh, when you're looking at China and this competition that you're describing, uh, there are several elements and you've raised them. Uh, there's the question of whether we can compete at home or whether we're too divided. And I wanna get back to that. Um, is the question of technology, can we keep up with China? And I wanna to talk to you about that. <clears throat> and that's wrapped up with what kind of a military threat might there be from China? So let me just touch on technology first. Um, <clears throat> do you feel that uh, the United States as a country and the Pentagon as the center of our military strength um, are prepared for this challenge. 
Um, technologically, we see that China is catching up with us. Uh, we see that the Biden administration wants to put a lot more money into R&D uh, to try to be more competitive. Uh, we see with the issues of semiconductors and Huawei that the United States is worried that China is going to get ahead of us in key technologies. So it, it talk a little bit about in this new world, how critical is technology and are, are we as a country up to the game? Well, Trudy, um, technology is critical uh, to our future. Uh, and I don't think there's any, any question about that. There's certainly no question in my mind that, that uh, we're always going to have to have the technological edge uh, on countries because technology will eventually, and certainly we see it today, govern. It'll, it'll govern all kinds of decisions. It'll, it'll govern economic decisions. It'll, it'll govern lifestyle decisions. Certainly it will govern weapons decisions and national security decisions. Uh, I think the United States uh, is very much up to this challenge. Uh, I think certainly the Pentagon is up to this challenge. I think the resources are gonna be available and, and have been available uh, over the years. You can take issue um, with specifics. Uh, we, we make mistakes uh, and we're gonna to continue to make mistakes. But one of the things that I, I always will lean on and move toward, not just because of history and, and the record, uh, but because of reality of, of what free enterprise does for a society, the, the inventiveness, the resourcefulness, because it all starts with people. Resources just don't come out of anywhere. They just don't drop from the sky. It's people who are at the beginning of resource development. And uh, because our people are free and, and they have choices, and they have resources that they can command, but, the, but that all starts with them. China is not that way. I'm not discounting at all the power of China and what they've been able to do uh, since they became the PRC in 1949. Uh, it's been remarkable. So I think I, 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 will always, I will always move toward and count on and have confidence in our kind of system, because China eventually is going to be is going to be confronted with a problem like like two lines on a graph. They have been playing in the world economy in this some uh, somewhat free economy, but it's it's not free. Uh, there's no freedom in, in China. At the same time, they're creating a lot of billionaires. They're creating a lot of wealthy people, a lot of expectations, and they're doing a lot of good for the country. But at the same time, that authoritarian line on the graph that she uh, has been very strident in implementing and continues to implement, that, that's gonna cross, that's gonna conflict at some point here. And uh, they're gonna have problems. They've got, they've got problems now. I think that's the other factor that you, you have to recognize, you recognize the strength of China, the resourcefulness of China, the history of China, the patience of China, all those uh, are, are very strong points for China. But you also understand they've got a lot of problems, uh, internal uh, problems. And you also understand that the world does not trust them. When you look at allies and friends and partners, uh, name, name five, allies and partners, real partners that China has or Russia has. They don't have them, either one of them. We do, we do and across the board. And that's why rebuilding alliances and rebuilding confidence in our leadership in those alliances is, is so important. So, so yes, technology is gonna always be uh, on the cutting edge, but it's people that make it happen. And the United States is more than up to it. Uh, we can win this game, but there'll then be another game and there'll be another game. And you have to look at it that way. I mean, this organization, which I think you're familiar with, Trudy, 
uh, in some on this call maybe at the uh, at the Pentagon, Pentagon called DARPA. It's it's a research arm, all top secret, that uh, <clears throat> that was instituted many many years ago within uh, within the Pentagon, and it is it is there for one reason to stay ahead of cutting edge technology, way ahead. Most people know nothing about it, and they're not supposed to know anything about it. So I think the American people should have some confidence in our military, uh, in our leadership, uh, our system, our people, uh, and, and our country to, to stay ahead. And I think we will stay ahead. But it, it's going to be a big challenge, and, and uh, it won't be easy because things are so much more complicated today than after World War II or 20 years ago. Um, as you know, uh, there is much renewed discussion about a book and a concept that Graham Allison pop, uh, popularized uh, several years ago, the Thucydides Trap, uh, yeah. which argues that when a rising power uh, collides with a declining power, uh, inev almost inevitably, not inevitably, uh, war results. Do you think uh, that we are destined for war with China, or do you think it's possible uh, to, to cooperate at some level and compete without sliding, perhaps accidentally, into military conflict? Uh, uh, I would opt for your last, uh, your last point. I don't think war with China is inevitable. Uh, possible. Uh, we, need, we need to be ready, be prepared uh, uh, for, for war. Um, that's always the case. I mean, whether it's China or the Soviet Union or whatever it is, we, the 20th century certainly taught us that, uh, certainly taught the world that. And I hope we, we learn that lesson for, for, for many generations ahead of us. Uh, so yes, you always got to be prepared for any kind of conflict. Uh, but there, there are ways where we can cooperate uh, with China. I mean, obviously, climate change has gotten a lot of attention in the last few days because President Biden held the, the climate conference. Um, Secretary Kerry was in China uh, recently, and, and as he's been around the world uh, regarding climate. Now, we're not going to have the exact same interest in China. We're going to have conflicts there with on the environment, we're going to have differences, but that's an area that's generally of common interest to all nations, to all all people. Uh, there, there. That's that's one one example. There are ways that we can deal with China, uh, cooperate with China, and and of course we're, we're going to be competing with China. We compete with them now, uh, and we're going to continue to, to compete with them. But that doesn't necessarily mean war. I mean, we've got issues like Taiwan. Uh, human rights are, are going to be continue to be an issue. Uh, what's happening in Western China? What's happening in Hong Kong? Uh, what what Russia is doing? Uh, but but that's not exactly new. I mean, we we've always dealt with those kind of problems, and we've always had the same position. The human rights is something this country advocates. We value, and we stand up for that. Uh, so we'll have differences and we're gonna to continue to have them. But I, I, don't, uh, I don't think, I don't know this, I don't think China views uh, the United States. I've never been told this and I've met Xi a number of times in Chinese leaders in, in some pretty direct conversations. Uh, I or even hinted at that, that you are a declining power. Now they may think that, uh, I don't know. I don't think they're too smart for that. They know this country is not a declining power. Uh, we've had our problems, we've had our setbacks, sure, but we're not a declining power. So I would not define the issue between an emerging power and a declining power as, as the current case with China and the United States. Uh, you mentioned cyber. There is a new book out, which you, know, you probably know about, uh, uh, co-authored by Admiral Jim Stavridis, the yes. former NATO Sacra, called 2034, a novel of the next world war. And it's about the US and China sliding into a war uh, that neither wants in the South China Sea 
and partly that's due to cyber, where the Chinese knock out uh, the cyber capacity for Washington to communicate with its fleet. Um, do you think there's a danger of cyber war, including war in space, anti-satellite? And is the Pentagon prepared for that kind of war? Or are they sort of stuck in the old Cold War groove and weaponry? Well, I think there's always a danger uh, for what Stavridis' uh, book, the plot and, and, and the whole message in there uh, is about, sure. Uh, miscommunication can lead to that. A lot of things can lead to that. Uh, so yes, I think that's always a danger and I think that's always a reality. Uh, but I don't think that, that we're stuck in a, an old Cold War mentality. I think, uh, I think more that we're stuck um, more in a in, in a twenty year anti terrorism mentality, uh, and I say that in full recognition there are still terrorists out there that still want to do do great damage to this country and our allies, and we see evidence of that every day. Um, certainly, the, the Middle East and North Africa, uh, but we have been consumed with terrorism for the last twenty years. We've not paid attention to uh, our nuclear arsenal. When I was Secretary of Defense, uh, we had a major cheating scandal in the nuclear enterprise. And I went out to all the silos out in the West and visited them all. And I wanted to take a look. And I was the first secretary and many secretaries who'd actually been out, out to those silos and those, those nuclear bases because we just hadn't paid attention to it. Uh, first of all, the Soviet Union imploded. China wasn't where it is today. What was the threat? There wasn't any threat. I mean, yeah, there's always going to be a threat, but no big threat. And then terrorism comes along, 9-11. So it's all terrorism. We get into two wars. We invade. We occupy countries. And I'm using this as an example. The nuclear just gets taken off. Nobody pays attention. When I went out and looked at our nuclear facilities, I was, I was stunned. Uh, they were using 30 and 40 year old radios. Uh, they, had, they had tonnage doors that didn't open when they were supposed to. And we, we, re, we instituted a whole review. I got $5 billion additional put into uh, our budget from the Congress and President Obama agreed with me on this to update the, the, the whole nuclear enterprise. I just use this this is as one example. So yes, you're, you're always in some ways, in some areas playing catch up, but the mentality is not Cold War. And I think we're coming out of the anti-terrorism mentality that that's, that is our biggest threat. It's a threat, yes, it still is. But terrorism of cyber is a far bigger threat to the security of this country than the terrorism that ISIS or Al Qaeda or any group like that is, is, is gonna present. So you're always trying to stay ahead. And like I said in my earlier remarks, there's no such thing as status quo. You've got to project ahead all the time, all the time. And the Pentagon does that very well. I mean, they get beat up for a lot of dumb things they do and waste and so on, I get that. But um, it's, it's an imperfect institution, all of them are. But I wouldn't want to trade our, our military and our defense establishment for any other in the world, not even close. Uh, you talked about the importance of alliances. Uh, we've had a question on that, and it's something I want to follow up on. Um, do you see the allies in Europe and Asia uh, actually uh, uh, being willing to take a strong position in countering China when China gets aggressive. I mean, obviously there's been mixed messages and the alliances, especially with Europe have been frayed under Trump. Uh, but we see with Germany uh, that Merkel is determined to go ahead with the Nord Stream 2 pipeline. Um, and uh, in Asia, it's unclear whether there would be strong support for uh, a firm American position on Taiwan. I mean, how can 
the Biden administration tighten these alliances in a way that would give a message to China that there were limits about expansionism and aggressiveness? Well, that's a, that's a good question. And, and it also represents reality. Um, a lot of these countries are rethinking, as I said earlier, they're rethinking their position. Um, China has, has a very long arm, in, 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 including into Europe, um, trade, economy, um, rare earth materials, I mean, so many things. And they're not, a lot of these countries are not quite sure. They're not going to abandon the United States. They're not going to abandon our relationship or, or leave the NATO or leave the Western orbit. But they're, they're looking at it now a little differently than, and some much differently than they certainly did 10 years ago or five years ago. And, and partly it's, can we trust the United States? Joe Biden says this now, this is his position now. He may be out of office in three years. Somebody else may come in and have the same position that Trump had. And so we have to look out for our own future. No, that's reality and that's going on. And, and we, we need to, uh, not just by words, but by deeds and actions, convince our allies, first of all, that it is a new world. Second, we recognize like, like Germany's interest in that Nord Stream with Russia. I can understand Merkel and the Germans on this, a pipeline in, in to feed Germany, on there are some liabilities I'm sure Merkel and her and her uh, her associates are well aware of when you're dealing with Russia, but I can understand why they're interested in going forward with that. So that I think we've got to project to each of our allies our awareness of their own concerns, of their own issues, and we've got to address that. It's not good enough to just say we're back, we're going to lead, and we're going to take on China, we're going to take on Russia. That, that's that's not good enough. So we got to do it better and we got to do it smarter. I think if there's any person uh, in leadership in this country today who is probably better qualified than anyone else to do that, it's Biden. And he's brought a, a, a good team, a good solid experienced team in around them. Now, uh, whether they can do that uh, or not, I don't know. He's got, he's got big domestic problems. He's got political issues, not just with Republicans, but he, in his own party. I mean, he's got a pretty strong left uh, that's pushing him in some areas where it's making it difficult to compromise on, on internal domestic matters. So all of that is factoring in here, but uh, I think it can be done. And, and, and I think it's, we're gonna have to come at it differently than I think we ever have. Uh, but again, like I said before, there's no such thing as status quo. Everything is changing. And the interest of each nation is is changing. We also need to do something, and I think Trump was right on this. He, I think he just did it awkwardly and wasn't the right approach, is that we've got to ask more of our uh, allies and our partners, uh, especially in NATO. Now, that's not something that Trump just started. I mean, when I was Secretary of Defense, I talked about it all the time at all of our NATO meetings. Bob Gates talked about it. I mean, this goes back a, 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 long, a long way. On our partners in Asia, in the Pacific that you referenced, uh, that's more complicated because they're right there. And I, I, I remember uh, when I was in the Senate, I used to travel because I was on the Foreign Relations Committee and the Intelligence Committee over there a lot around the world. And so I heard it even, even then before I was Secretary of Defense, our allies in the Pacific, our strongest allies uh, and, and, and partners, trading partners would say, you know, Mr. Secretary or Senator, you don't live here. Um, we live here. You're, you're five, 6,000 miles away. We got to deal with China in reality, not theory. Uh, I, I know you've got bases here and, and you're committed in, in South, you mentioned South China Sea. I mean, I, I had two meetings with Xi in Beijing regarding the South China Sea and East China Sea. So we've got to deal with our, with our, partners and our allies in Asia a little differently as well, recognizing the threats, recognizing their interests, uh, 
and it, it's going to take diplomacy. It's going to take some new thinking, I believe, but with the same objective. And that, that's why I think Biden's going to have to come at it. Right. Um, I want to bring in a question from the audience. Uh, a Wharton alumnus asked, uh, considering recent problems at the Suez Canal, uh, uh, he, he said, do you consider Russia's proposal of implementing a new route through the Bering Strait a potential geopolitical threat? Um, Hmm. I, I, I read it wrong. I thought he was going to be speaking about uh, Erdogan's proposal. Uh, uh, <laughs> but um, uh, uh, this is something that, uh, is this something you've thought about? It is. Uh, the, I mean, essentially the Arctic, our interest in the Arctic. Uh, right. When I was Secretary of Defense, I was the first Secretary of Defense to implement an Arctic defense strategy. And I announced it in, uh, in Canada, in Halifax, Canada in November of 2013. Uh, and, and we had, it was a large paper and, and so on. It was a strategy that they're still using and they've modified and they've improved at the Pentagon. But it's the first time there was, we had, the Pentagon had ever articulated a real strategy about the Arctic. Uh, we're way behind in the Arctic. And the Chinese are over in playing in the Arctic. Right. Uh, and they've got some of the most sophisticated ice cutters and shipping up there. Uh, R Russians, for the Russians, that's, that's a natural spot. And they're renewing the old Soviet bases up there along the Arctic and the Bering Sea and the trade routes, the melting of the glaciers and the environment and all that's, that's coming uh, about that we know about is all shifting and changing everything. And so that, that's going to be a, a central location of interest, commercial interest, defense interest, uh, as it is now, but it's, it's going to become more and more important. We're way behind there. I mean, we've got aging ice cutters. I mean, it's just, it, it makes no sense. And uh, so that's a good question because I, I think we've got to pay attention, really pay attention to doing something and that's an area that we're going to have to find cooperation with the russians on now those those other arctic countries canada is an, an important one uh but that's so does denmark uh the the, the five nations up there we, we've got to we've got to find some common interest and put something together here uh some kind of institutional ground rules because if we don't, if we if we allow it to drift and become uh, kind of a, a free zone, every man for themselves, it'll become very dangerous. And and again, the Chinese are up there; nothing's stopping them. You, you can say what you want, uh, but the Chinese see an interest, and they're going after it. Well, that raises another issue. Um, it, you have this cooperation in the Bering Straits, or if not cooperation, uh, both together uh, making use of this uh, potentially uh, groundbreaking new route, uh, thanks to climate change. What about Chinese-Russian cooperation in general? Uh, do you see this as a serious problem? Well, um, it's not new, as we know. Um, the Soviets uh, did it all the time. Uh, their, their common interests are, I think, as much driven by do as much damage to the United States as we can. Uh, and and if, our, if our interests can combine to help slow down or defeat the United States in any way, then, then that's good for both for us, the Russians and the Chinese. I think that's, that's their, their real common interest. Um, I don't know the insides of those institutions. I know all the leaders. I know you know, uh, something about it, but I don't think either side trusts each other. I don't think they ever have. Uh, I'm not so sure they even like each other, but, but they will accommodate each other and they'll accommodate each other's interest if it's in their interest as well. So yes, it, it's a concern of mine. 
uh, it's been a concern, and I think most of our leaders in the national security business uh, over the years uh, have, have been concerned about that collaboration between the two of them with, with their satellite, their, their, their defense capabilities, their cyber capabilities. Uh, neither one of them, I think, are going to give the other one anything uh, in the way of, of we'll give you something that you don't already have. I don't think that'll, that'll happen. Uh, and because they're totalitarian governments, authoritarian governments, they, they are always held back by that. They're not near as open on, on anything. So, but is it a concern? Yes, it's a concern, but it's been a concern. It's, it's not a new concern. The Arctic presents uh, another new concern in that partnership of China and Russia. What about the Eastern Mediterranean in terms of China and Russia? Um, the threat from China is not just military per se, but also economic. You have China buying up ports, investing in ports, uh, Piraeus, Haifa, along the Suez Canal, um, and all around the Mediterranean. And you have Russia uh, building big port in Tartus, going into Libya, and you had joint exercises between Russia and China in the Eastern Med a few years ago. Um, are we asleep at the switch uh, between critical waterways, not just in South China Sea, but closer to home, uh, being dominated by China plus Russia? Well, I do think we've missed a lot of it, Trudy. Uh, uh, yeah, I do. And all the time that we were consumed, as I said, the last 20 years with terrorism, terrorism locked into these two forever unwinnable wars that were still in both of them, uh, that gave the Russians and the Chinese an immense amount of free time and free space where we took our attention off of all of that. And uh, everything that you recited is, is accurate. And uh, yes, th those are very dangerous signals that we're sending. The Chinese are not so much a military threat to the United States. I mean, in that area, of course, in their area, uh, but they're certainly through using their trade and their power and the economics, they certainly uh, have been able to get into every, every region of the world. And, and you know all, all the stories. I mean, I remember when I go to Africa, when I was in the Senate, different African countries, I'd see a, a new soccer stadium or a, a new hospital, uh, new roads. And I said, that's, that's, that's a wonderful thing that you, oh, the Chinese, the Chinese did it. And I said, really, the Chinese did it. And well, what they, a lot, of, a lot of them didn't tell me was at the same time, the Chinese were locking up 50 year bauxite contracts and, and port contracts and so on and so on. That's the way they operate. And that's the way they've been very clever about that. And I don't, I don't think we've paid a lot of attention to that. And uh, it's, it's gonna be a problem for us. There's a question here in Africa, which is a good follow up. The viewer asks, um, what if any demographic changes, uh, for example, growth rates in African nations, uh, do you see having an impact on the balance of power? Well, I think everybody knows that Africa is a very important continent with its resources uh, and uh, where it is uh, and, and everything it represents um, and the human capital. Uh, yes, I, and I, I think for a long time, we have not paid a lot of attention to it other than use it for AFRICOM, for example, for a, a military base, different bases around. And uh, we've done some good things, especially in West Africa, uh, but almost all our relationships in East Africa have been in somehow related to terrorism and, and, and our involvement in the Middle East. Uh, and so we've got to come up with a whole new strategy, it seems to me, in how we're going to deal with Africa and the potential and the reality and and what's going on. I mean, in many ways, and certainly a lot of those countries, North Africa, East Africa, they're going backwards. They're going backwards, dangerously so. 
and uh, we've got to we've got to find a new way to approach uh, our African friends, where they can they can uh, again trust have some trust and some confidence in us that, that we can help them with different things. Now we have over the years helped many of those countries in many ways, but it but it's always been kind of a transactional uh, relationship with many of those countries. Yeah, we'll we'll do this for this or something. Well, if you're doing that, they'll have the same transactional approach to China or, or to somebody else as they're having with you because it's a transactional deal. And uh, so so we've we've got to pay more attention to that. I mean, what we're discussing here and pay more attention to different things and watch this and Arctic and Africa and so on. You, you we start to appreciate how big this effort is and how immense this job is of of taking care of America's role in the world and our interests in the world. And it's it's and I think a mistake we've made, Trudy, over the, especially the last 20 years, we go back to Vietnam, is we we have led with our military. We put the military in positions, well, you the military will do it. Military can change the government, they can change the economy, and they can fight the terrorists and so on. Well, the military can't do all that. And they've they failed at, at all this. It's not their fault. And, and so we've not paid enough, enough attention to diplomatic economic combinations and efforts. I'm not taking any away from, uh, from what we should be doing with the military and, and focusing on a strong military, but we got to even this out. I mean, the State Department budget is pitiful. It's a joke, uh, and we've we've got to we've got to even our resource base out more for our own interest. We just not, I don't think we just we've been smart in how we've done this. Well, following on that uh, point, uh, one viewer asks if there's no direct war, what about the potential and effect of proxy wars, uh, say in Africa or the Americas? Uh, maybe we're not just talking about military proxy wars, but um, uh, what kind of proxy wars, if any, uh, do you see between uh, China and us, Russia and us, in, in other continents, yeah. uh, Latin America or Africa? Well, as we know, proxy wars uh, certainly aren't new, and we've, uh, we've seen them <clears throat> over the years. And and that is a threat because when we talk about different groups, terrorist groups, or, or adjunct groups uh, of any country or any philosophy or any ideology where they can be bought um, and armed, now this is what we're going to do. You, this is going to be your mission, and we'll give you this money, and, and so on and so on. I mean, Africa is the prime place for that. Um, we're seeing some of that and have seen that in the Middle East uh, uh, as, as well. Um, quite frankly, when the Russians were in Afghanistan, um, we were financing the Mujahideen. I mean, there was a proxy war going on there in a way. And so, I mean, we played that game too. But I, I think the questioner is right to focus on this because I think you're going to see more of it. Uh, so it won't be Russia and the United States in conflict. For example, the uh, uh, the invasion of Russia, of the Ukraine, in eastern Ukraine, in Crimea. I was Secretary of Defense at the time, and I was on the phone with Shoigu, their defense minister, all the time, and Lavrov, and so on. Uh, they denied that it was it was their their troops. I mean, in Crimea, they did not deny it because they were already in Crimea. They had a they had a long-term contract with the Ukrainian government to be there, so they were there. But th that eastern Ukraine, the little green men, the jokes about the little green men, no insignia is, uh, no, they're not our guys. I mean, these are just nationalists that uh, are sick and tired of the Ukrainian government. Well, it was, that's a, it was a complete lie. We knew it. Uh, but that was a proxy war. They, they were playing a little game here, and, and, they, and they did. Uh, used a, a lot of the Eastern Ukrainians and Western Russians to, to do that for them, uh, that they weren't Russian regulars 
a, a lot of them uh, in there. So, no, it's it's a it's an issue that it's going to be with us a long time, and we're going to have to pay attention. A questioner asks uh, or says, "I'm hoping that Biden and Secretary Hagel are in touch still. Are they?" What is the secretary's top piece of advice to the Biden administration <laughs> on defense? Well, uh, Joe Biden is an old friend, a good friend uh, who I admire greatly. We've been all over the world together. We worked together for over 20 years uh, on a lot of things. I mean, it was kind of interesting because his voting record, and my voting record were, were a long way apart in the Senate. Uh, but not on foreign policy, not on national security, not on trade policy, those kind of things. Uh, we weren't. And uh, uh, yes, I'm still in touch with the president. Um, I'm still in touch with his administration. Um, talk to Secretary Austin, Secretary Biden, uh, other people. And I've worked with all of them. Uh, over the years, and they're all very competent, good people. So um, uh, I'm, I, I'm, I stay in touch with them, um, and, and they know I'll help them in any way uh, I, I can. I, I don't want another government job. I've, I've been privileged with having some great jobs in the government, which I've always appreciated, uh, but I don't want another one. I mean, I'll help them with uh, anything that I can help them with. Uh, advice, well, I think uh, uh, Biden, you know, has been at this for 44 years and his people have been around a while and I'm not sure they need any advice from me, but I, I've always, uh, always told uh, Joe Biden and uh, all my associates and friends over the years when we were traveling and so on, uh, you, you've got to see the world as it is. Uh, listen, peripheral vision, know what's going on, and always, always, always do what you think is in the best interest of this country, no matter what the consequences, political consequences might be, uh, that's your responsibility. And, and I, think, uh, uh, I, th I think Biden will follow that. I mean, it's just not my advice. He knows that. But uh, uh, because I know him so well, I think, I think he will do that. Now, he, he'll make mistakes. Uh, uh, all leaders do, uh, but I used to tell, uh, I used to tell President Obama, well, <clears throat> Pre Mr. President, we'll, we'll make some mistakes, but we just don't want to make the big mistakes. <laughs> um, well, it, uh, speaking of possible big mistakes, uh, what should the president do on Taiwan? Is that a potential big mistake? <laughs> well, that's a tough question. Uh, and everybody, I think, understands why it's a tough question. I mean, the, the Chinese have believed that was, it was an outlaw uh, group, Chiang Kai-shek, uh, who fled the mainland and went to Taiwan. Taiwan belongs to China. Uh, I mean, that's where they are. And I, I don't think the Chinese waver on that. Now because Taiwan economically has done so well and uh, their technology, I mean, everything. Um, and I recognize the dy dynamic here. Um, I think a question for China has gotta be, um, do we really want to risk destroying what Taiwan has developed into uh, by a very costly invasion of Taiwan to take that back forcibly. And we don't know where the United States is, uh, possibly start a war with the United States. Uh, and I think the position that we've always had with Taiwan, right from the beginning, right, go back to 1979, one China policy, uh, we don't recognize, as everybody knows, Taiwan is a sovereign nation here. They're, they're they're, they don't have an ambassador here. It's a representative of Taiwan and so on. But yet, we, uh, we sell them arms, very sophisticated arms. Uh, we patrol that area. Uh, we've made our position very clear to China. 
So uh, what we, we hope that we can maintain is that we don't get into a showdown confrontation uh, because it would be very costly. It'd be very costly to everybody. It'd be very costly to everybody if that would, would happen. And try to convince the Chinese their best interest uh, are let, let things continue to develop as they are, not status quo because they won't. Uh, different generations of Chinese and Taiwanese, you're, you're seeing, and you've seen this over the last 20 years, different leaders of Taiwan go to China and talked about reunification, peaceful reunification. Uh, so there, there, there's been conversation about how do we fix this over the years here? Uh, and uh, I think that's, that's the right way to continue to approach it. Well, I thank you very, very much. Um, uh, this has been very helpful and it's a little bit of optimism in what you said <laughs> that we can avoid war. So back to you, Mike, uh, for final words and uh, thanks again, Secretary Hagel. Trudy, it's been a, a real pleasure and an honor. Uh, and I am optimistic. I, I mean, I'm optimistic, but I'm, I'm very much a realist. I'm as much a realist as anybody is, but I'm still optimistic. Well, well, thanks so much to both of you for this fascinating discussion and for taking the time to speak with us about the future of American defense policy and emerging threats around the world. I actually had the, the honor of spending some time in the Defense Department when Secretary Hagel was there, and, and he was a, an incredible leader, and it's been a real privilege to have him uh, with us uh, at uh, Perry World House uh, this year, and, and hopefully uh, someday he can come here in person. And, uh, and thank you to the audience for joining us for this edition of The World Today. Uh, as always, you can access a recording of this conversation on our YouTube channel. Although today was our last official The World Today of the semester, we, we might have a few events coming up after this and you can stay connected with Perry World House by joining our mailing list and following us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Perry World House. We'll drop links to all of those in the chat. Uh, thanks uh, again, uh, Secretary Hagel and uh, Trudy Rubin for joining us. It's a real honor to have both of you uh, associated with Perry World House. Thanks, Michael. Have a great day, everybody.